Project Deep Sleep comes together on horsepower today as the 427 comes to rest inside the plain chain Ford, followed by the six-speed trans and more upgrades. Then the guys have to fab their way through fitment, all in uncharted T-Bird territory. In our quest to build a bad sleeper bird, we took a 427 Voss short block, filled it with a hefty high performance parts combo, and loaded it on our dyno. Here we go for a 610 horsepower fail. Today's the day to drop it in. After tearing down the original K member, removing everything but the spindles, control arms, and steering rack, we're ready to pressure wash it clean. Then with a little help from our trans jack, we can raise it up and bolt it into place. We need to go ahead and lay the new ADCO front sway bar in place now while it can still clear the factory K-member. For motor mounts, we found a company online that specializes in niche applications called turbochuck.com. They're constructed with laser cut cold rolled steel, hand welded and powder coated. Best of all, they fit great. We know some oil pan mods are in order. And after a test fit and marking it, I can take the trusty cutoff wheel to it. You good? Mm -hmm. Then we bolt it back in place as is to see what we've got. This will keep the mount straight from yeah. rolling in. Is this what I got a problem with over here? Close, very close. John takes a small chunk from the K member and I take a few more out of the pan and close it up. And finally, some post-op cleaning to finish it up. Well, almost. Now you're not done until you check for leaks. My confidence is running high. The results? All right, Mike, you're good. Well, yeah. Before it bolts back in place, though, a coat of paint, more for rust protection than cosmetic. All right, this should be the home run we were looking for right here. I hope so. Okay, down. Looking good. Look at that, it's gonna go right into Man, the hole. Man, it sure is, isn't it? Where you at, I'm on. I'm on. We're good right here. I can fit my hand in between there. Plenty of clearance here. That's what I like to see. Oh yeah, that's money. Good deal. Like it was made for it. The transmission is next and it was made for it. And here's why. When you modify your rear end with shorter 410 gears like we did, the trade-off is usually higher RPMs at cruising speed. Not this time though. We're stepping up to one of TCI's 4L80E based six-speed automatics the first made to handle up to 850 horsepower. It's a pretty compact design, all things considered. They dyno test each one, and they're good for a street all the way up to full race applications. Now, we're also using some of their other trans-related components we'll tell you about as we go, beginning with the torque converter. Oh, I think it's heavy. This TCI torque converter is a 10-inch street fighter with a billet front cover and 3,000 RPM stall speed. Underneath, the flex plate goes on to the crankshaft. Then we can raise the transmission into place. Almost. All right, this one started. And make sure it stays there. Now we're ready to measure for our drive shaft. Now, if this is your first time tackling this, there's a lot more than just one measurement. Now, we're gonna have Dynatech Engineering build our shafts, so we went to their website and printed off their order form. Now, it's gonna have a list of all the measurements we need to get the correct length shaft. First, the distance from the trans extension housing to the pinion flange. 59 and 3 quarter. Then, the diameter of the pinion flange pilot, which is two inches. The number of bolt holes in the flange, which is eight. The bolt hole circle diameter, which is 3550. Next, the distance between the trans output shaft and the extension housing. 672. Finally, count the number of splines on the shaft, and we have 32. Now just fill out the form, fax it to them, and they'll send you exactly what you need. While Mike faxes in that order, John and I can get busy on the front suspension. Yeah, don't you think these are due for an upgrade? Swapping out the upper control arm. 
Yeah, that's more like it. Strut and spring assemblies are next, and yeah, I guess we're spoiled, but this professional compressor from Matco is a lot more efficient and safer than the old way. First, to free up the stock strut from the spring to remove the strut mount, then to squeeze the new spring and bolt the new strut to the mount. Now we can stab the strut and spring into place, bolt it to the lower control arm on bottom, and secure it on top using this new strut brace. Next, we connect the new lower control arm to the spindle, and with new end leaks, connect the sway bar to the spindle. Now the front brakes, and we're sliding on more EBC slotted rotors, more blue stuff brake pads, and the calipers. Now we've got what we need to handle and harness a 610 horsepower T-Bird. Horsepower's back after dropping our 427 into the 97 T-Bird. Finishing the suspension and bolting up a TCI six-speed automatic transmission. It all fits fine now, with one exception. The new trans is way too long for the stock cross member. So we're making a new one using a couple of pieces of steel plating, welding them in place farther back. Then adding two tabs to a piece of three-inch pipe which a bolt goes through. Then we'll weld that to our flat plates on each side. Next, a horizontal bar gets welded up to the pipes, followed by another pair of brackets to support a mounting plate for the trans mount. Now our six-speed auto has a solid place to mount. The only problem is our exhaust has to run through right here. We'll get to that in a minute. Right now, there's some fabrication that needs to be done to our 427's headers. The driver's side header fits pretty well, with only a little fabrication required. The passenger side tubes, that's another story. They need extensive cutting and welding to overcome all kinds of interference issues. We expected this though, since there's no aftermarket set made for our unique engine and car combination. Now these hooker headers are made for a Fox Body Mustang 351 swap, the closest thing we could find. While Mike finishes that, John's getting to work on the fuel delivery system, which now includes this jazz aluminum fuel cell with a sending unit. And would you believe it, more modifications. That's because earlier in this project, we removed the factory fuel tank to make room for our custom-made subframe connectors, along with a horizontal bar for reinforcement. To mount the cell in the trunk, John first welds in a couple of support plates inside the spare tire well. And after cutting a piece of tubing to length, he'll secure it to the top of the plates. Then weld a couple of smaller plates to the bar. The fuel cell's mounting tabs bolt to them, and up front, the other tabs simply bolt to the floor of the trunk. Inside the bird, John takes some measurements for a couple of pieces of sheet metal that serve as a firewall between the fuel cell and the car's interior. And they're held in place with pop ribbons. Now with the car back up, it's time for the moment of tubular truth. To see if this massively modified header fits, and it does. Now the Felpro gasket can go in before finally bolting it in with ARP fasteners. To know how tight we can pack the exhaust, we need to slide our new three and a half inch steel Dynatech drive shaft into the transmission housing and secure it to the rear end. We'll use lots of bent tubing, universal cats, clamps, and cherry bomb muffler. Not to mention workouts with the cold saw and the TIG welder. First, to get the new catalytic converters installed. Then, to make the tubes route around the new trans mount and over the horizontal support bar. Now these extremes got the muffler vote because they're compact and extremely free flowing. Finally, a pair of turn down pipes and clamps to finish up. It took a lot of time, test fitting, trimming, and melting TIG rods, but not a bad system for self-made. And that gets us back to the fuel system and drilling some holes in the trunk floor to feed and return fuel. We're using a combo kit from Weldon that includes a 100 micron filter with dash 10 fittings for our super stock lines from Earl's, protected by these special Daystar boots. The heart of the Weldon kit 
is an A600 pump that can flow up to 85 gallons per hour, enough to feed 800 horsepower. From their regulator, we install more super stock lines up to the engine. Well, that is the end of the line for today, at least. You see, we got to wait for our last round of parts to come in. Then we can bring it back for a finale and finally take this sleeper out and see if we can give some Mustangs a real nightmare or two. Horsepower's back with a question. How do you make your daily driver double as a weekend drag race car? I mean, we all want the best of both worlds with the best bang for the good old buck. So where do you start? That's a question I posed to Rob Downing, who's crew chief for Summit Racing's Pro Stock Team, multi-year NHRA champions. Rob's a believer in planning the power before adding power. The first thing that I would do is, is change the ring and pinion. That, that's going to give us the most ET for our dollar. Let's just say, for instance, your car came with a 355 rearing gear from the factory. So what we'd want to do is go to somewhere in the 411 range or somewhere in the low 40 range, which is going to give the engine more advantage on the tire, which is going to make the tire think your engine's making more power. Rob says his second street strip investment would be rubber, and that relates to your car's tranny. If you've got a, uh, a stick shift car, for instance, we're probably going to go right to a drag slick. We've got an automatic car. We, we can kind of cheat a little bit, put a drag radio on that thing. And, and be able to drive that on the street a little bit, drive it to and from the track, so to speak. Uh, the next thing you're going to need is some sort of a, a, a drag, good drag shock to, uh, to take care of, because we're probably going to start having some wheel hop. Overall, the, the rear shock is just going to give more control over the tire. So yes, the damping is going to be higher. Um, it's going to depend on your type of car, whether it's an independent rear suspension or solid axle, uh, how that instant center on that suspension is set up, whether it's going to be more biased to the rebound or to the compression. That's something that you're just going to have to play with once you get to the track. Okay, good start, but how much cash do we start shelling out? I think we could do this whole package for somewhere in the $1,500, $1,600, $1,700 range, just depending upon uh, what, what type of wheels you're going to go with. And uh, again, what type of vehicle it is, is going to determine, for instance, if you've got to do a drag strut or, or just a, a more inexpensive uh, front drag shock. Of course, the spending won't stop there. But hey, neither will the fun, will it? Coming up, Royal Purple challenges horsepower to put its high-performance coolant to the ultimate test. It's a throwdown showdown on the Jesse Dino, where the most cool rules. You're watching Horsepower. For a DVD copy of this episode, just go to PowerBlockTV.com and order your copy for just $5.95 plus shipping and handling. Start your own Horsepower collection, delivered right to your door from the PowerBlock. If you're into the nostalgic deep tone of the good old glass pack, well, this Magnaflow ought to bring back some cool sounding memories. Now, theirs is made with an aluminized steel body, a straight through perforated inner core with acoustic material between them. Now, it's CNC welded, made in the USA, and made for your budget with a price of about 33 bucks. Do you hate engine clutter, especially on your HEI distributor? Well, check out this Excel corrected distributor cap that gets rid of those ugly crossed up wires by putting odd numbers on the driver's side and even ones on the passenger side for a clean, neat appearance. It's also got brass terminals for better energy conduction and special ribs and tall towers to eliminate crossfire. It's a direct fit for GM HEI V8s and carries a price tag of $50. Here's a way to get the benefits of larger rear brakes inside your small diameter wheels. It's Bear's SS4 system that uses a compact four piston caliper, a 12 by one inch rotor that's cross drilled, slotted and vented and a self-contained emergency brake that's built onto the backing plate. Now the two-piece billet caliper uses a brake pad that's shared with many aftermarket brake companies, so finding them is pretty easy. Now the kit's designed to fit inside most 15-inch wheels. Now all the components meet DOT specifications and are legal in all 50 states. If you like it, put on the brakes, pick up your wallet, and get in touch with SummitRacing.com.
Next, if you're a weekend racer, you already know that in addition to your opponents, you have to constantly battle heat. Most trips prohibit the use of coolant because spills can cause dangerous track conditions. But there is a track compliant trick that you can try and it's designed to help you beat the heat. It's Royal Purple's reformulated synthetic called Purple Ice. We're going to put it to the test using our buddy's 1972 Ford Lariat. It's not just a cool old truck, it's got a potent Cobra jet under the hood with three two-barrel carbs. It's also got a big fat new radiator we're first going to drain and then fill with straight water just like at the track. Next, we'll mount our shop's infrared thermometer in front of the engine for constant temperature monitoring. The red laser dot shows it's aimed right at the engine block. Now Mike lets the engine idle until it reaches a stable operating temperature. In this case, 121 degrees. Then John uses our DinoJet computer to put a load on the drivetrain, simulating an uphill climb. After two minutes, we stop the run and the thermometer reads 145 degrees. Okay, after a little cool down, we add two bottles of purple ice, the recommended amount for straight water. Then we again bring the engine to operating temperature. This time it stabilizes at a cooler 111 degrees. Now another two minutes with the very same uphill load. And at the end of the run, the surface engine temperature is 133 degrees. So compared to straight water, the engine had a 10 degree cooler operating temperature with purple ice and water. More important perhaps, a 12 degree cooler temperature after the two minute simulated load. Purple ice has also been proven to resist rust, corrosion and scaling in addition to lubricating water pump seals. Now our little test today was far from scientific, but hey, if you're looking for a winning edge, just might ice the deal for you. Okay, that's it. We quit, for now at least. We'll see you next time.